consternation of many fans, the WWE has been PG since 2008. And if the name change from WWF to WWE in 2002, where we were told to get the F out, which is when it felt like a lot of the fun got out of professional wrestling, and specifically the now WWE, the PG era has been a source of great angst and frustration for so many of us for a variety of reasons. Now, with that said, not every single thing has been bad. Not every single thing has been terrible. There have been some good things, some good times, some great moments, some great times since 2008 in the WWE. And today, for the eighth day of OTR Essential Christmas, it feels like in this season of giving and loving and caring and sharing that we take a fond look back at some of the rare good things that have happened by talking about the eight greatest moments of the PG era. And yes, since it became PG in 2008, I classify as everything since then the PG era. You don't like it, kick rocks. Let's get started. Get to the official list of my eight greatest moments of the PG era. There are other moments that just missed the list. My honorable mentions, Shawn Michaels versus The Undertaker at WrestleMania 25. What more do I need to say? Why didn't it make the list? Because it ultimately mid-carded that WrestleMania. Bret Hart returning to the WWE on January 4th, 2010 and confronting Shawn Michaels and confronting Vince McMahon, it was, if nothing else, one of those must-see moments. The debut in June of 2010 of The Nexus. That debut is still memorable to this day. Just everything afterwards involving that group was pretty much forgettable. Who could forget The Rock returning to the WWE for the first time in almost seven years on the Valentine's Day 2011 edition of Monday Night Raw when the announcement was made that he was going to be the guest host of WrestleMania 27. It was an awesome, spectacular moment. One that many of you probably would put on your eight greatest list for the PG era, Mark Henry's fake-out retirement on the June 17, 2013 edition of Raw. That's right, a world's strongest slam to John Cena. That's what he'd do. That's what he'd do. But just missed the list here. The Hogan-Austin Rock uh, opening segment at WrestleMania 30. You watch that and you're like, my God. Whether it's in the Silver Dome, whether it's in the Superdome, it doesn't matter. It's epic. It's awesome. Daniel Bryan, Breakfast Club Killer. And his pursuit to get to the top of the mountain and become WWE champion to close out WrestleMania 30. Now, surely a lot of you are going to be angry with me that it's not on the list. But here, if your flaming keyboard fingers of fire are not already in engage rage mode, how about this? Seth Rollins cashing in the next year at WrestleMania 31 to become the world champion didn't make the top eight either. So there. What almost made the list, Triple H entering 30 and winning the 2016 Royal Rumble and becoming the WWE Champion. It's God, number 30, you just can't politic this much better. Shane McMahon's return to the WWE in February of 2016 after being gone for over six years was a massive surprise. Goldberg squashing Brock Lesnar at Survivor Series 2016 and what a minute and 26 seconds? That was a moment. It was an awesome moment to me. So there have been moments, but these moments just weren't good enough to crack the list. What was, though? Well, you're about to find out, so settle the head down and get your panties out of a bunch. It's time. It's time. It's Veda time. No, you didn't make the list. But here are the eight greatest moments of the PG era. It's my list, so you had to know that Psycho Sid was going to find his way to softball his ass on there. And here he is at number eight, Psycho Sid's return to the WWE on Raw in 2012. I don't care what anybody else thinks about this moment. This is my list, and it's about my greatest moments. And seeing Psycho Sid over 12 years after that devastating leg-shattering incident at Sin 2001 to see him come out in a WWE ring and still show that he can indeed rule the world and rock those denim cutoffs like nobody's business and the freaking curly mullet. 
top-notch stuff still to this day. It's freaking Psycho Sid. How could this not be a top moment? He broke his leg to entertain you and came back for what a mortal man would consider a career-ending injury. Psycho Sid came back. And we all know, you know and I know, that you are half the man that he is. And he has half the brain that you do. And personally, I am sick and tired of week after week after week of everybody coming out and trying to make him look like a jackass. Psycho Sid's return to WWE in 2012 was magnificent. Absolutely legendary. It's Raw. It's 2010. Batista is the champion. And he gives us one of the goldest of golden nuggets in raw promo history. <laughs> he says, bark, 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 Cena. That's what you do. <laughs> That's not what I do. <laughs> so you can go on and keep on kissing babies and hugging fat girls. <laughs> Every single time I think about that promo, I just bust out laughing because we know Cena loves to kiss the babies and due to his appearance on the Howard Stern Show years before, we know Cena loves them fat girls. <laughs> and to hear Batista say it in the tone and the context that he said, kissing babies and hugging fat girls, <laughs> how could that not be one of the eight greatest moments of the PG era? <laughs> Tear down the cockpit door. Oh, Koken. Now, I don't care what you want to say about him as a performer, as a person, about the way he lived his life and conducted himself. That's not what this is about. What this is about are great moments of the PG era. And when you think about, for older fans like me who grew up on the Ultimate Warrior, was a fan of the Ultimate Warrior, and knew how batshit crazy this dude was, the whole premise and concept of him getting a live mic on live television, Monday Night Raw, and being given an open platform to say something was magical in and of itself. And then the promo, which ultimately ended up being the last we ever heard from the Ultimate Warrior before he died of a heart attack the next day. This son of a bitch was so crazy, he got himself blowed up from a freaking promo. It was great. It was epic. It was awesome. One day, every man's heart beats its last beat. Whatever the hell he said, the fucking point is, it's one of the truly great promos on so many different levels that I've seen in the past 10 years of professional wrestling, period. Now, I still harbor lingering resentment for him ending the streak at WrestleMania 30. It's true. And I've never been a huge fan of his. That is also true. However, I cannot deny that when Brock Lesnar, after being gone from the WWE for eight years, trying to go play football, wrestling some in Japan, and ultimately finding a home in UFC and becoming heavyweight champion, there was a tremendous amount of appeal there for Brock Lesnar coming back to WWE, coming back home in a way. Would he do it? Would it ever happen? And people, frankly, didn't know and maybe thought it wouldn't be possible. But that night after WrestleMania 28, there in Miami, when Brock's music hits as John Cena's sitting there in his freaking fruity colored green shirt looking all types of stupid, and Brock Lesnar comes out, the roof blew off of that joint. It was a moment. It is one of those moments that keeps you as a wrestling fan. And it's one of those big things you're talking about the night after WrestleMania. You had Rock, you had Cena. Where do you go from there? It was a hell of a way to go from there. And there's no question, when you think about it, Brock has had a better run this time around than his first time around. And this run has been significantly longer. It's going to be coming up on six years here at WrestleMania 34, almost three times longer than his first run from 2002 to 2004. Just think about that. It was a big moment. It was a significant moment. And one we were never really sure was ever going to happen, but it did.
Sometimes you'll hear the phrase, breaking the internet. And every once in a while something comes along that does break the internet. And while I don't think this quite broke the internet, it most certainly broke wrestling internet. And that was the famous CM Punk pipe bomb promo back on Raw in June of 2011. Looking past all the crap that came afterwards and all the stupidity that happened and all the ways that WWE screwed up what should have been an epic summer of punk that year, you cannot deny the impact, the meaning, and the significance of that pipe bomb promo six and a half years later. People still talk about this thing. People still obsess over this thing. It's got its own name. It's its own thing. It is universally classified as one of the greatest promos in wrestling history that people have ever seen, one of the greatest work shoot promos of all time. And there is no doubt that at that point in time, it bumped up CM Punk, elevated his profile, and took him to another level. It absolutely did. Again, six and a half years later, for a guy that's been gone from the company for almost four years now, this CM Punk pipe bomb promo, excuse me, still lives on. It has to be one of the great moments of the PG era. While The Rock coming back on Valentine's Day 2011 was a huge deal, to me, the thing that always resonated the most was when The Rock beat John Cena at WrestleMania 28. Now, sure, through the scope of history, we can look back and say, well, we know what happened the last next year at WrestleMania 29 in New York and da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Buck all that shit. When you're looking at this, Matt, there was an infinite amount of dread in my mind thinking about this is like the rock is coming back just simply to ultimately job to john cena and there was a lot of debate should john cena win should the rock win and what's going to happen and how does wwe pull this off and how does it work and as you watch the match the match was what the match was but son of a bitch when the rock hit that rock bottom and that ref counted one two three that was a moment. That was a magical moment for the adult fans like me who have stuck through the thick and thin that have supported this company for so many years, sometimes smacking in the face of all logic and wondering why we still do. This was our moment to say, fuck you, John Cena. This was our moment to say, fuck the kids. This was our moment to say, fuck the ladies. This was our moment to say, fuck the John Cena fanboys. Fuck the John Cena apologists. Fuck this PG era. Fuck Vince McMahon and fuck everybody. The Rock, a real man. The representation of so many things that used to be great about this company and so many things that were great about professional wrestling as a whole when a man was a man. And these guys were actually stars, mega stars, larger than life characters. It was for that one night and that one moment we were able to overlook all that other John Cena, Fruity Pebble bullshit. And we were able to vicariously live through The Rock. The Brahma Bull, the People's Champ, the Great One. For one night, it was our night where we could look past all that PG crap and pretend like things were all good again. When it comes to sports, and in particular as well, professional wrestling, phrases like superstar, legend, icon, get thrown out way too loosely, way too liberally. The less you use that term, the more it means and the more it's appropriate. But when you think about modern professional wrestling and you think about true superstars, true legends, true icons, Sting is just that. And one of the greatest appeals for Sting, honestly, all those years of his career was the fact that he never came to Vince. He didn't need Vince. He became what he became without Vince. And it was a redeeming quality of his. And it was one of those things that you sat there and you're like, man, respect level 100 for a dude like this that says, I don't need Vince and I don't have to have Vince. And he never did and he still doesn't to this day. 
But as you got to all the buzz and talking about potentially Sting versus The Undertaker at WrestleMania 27, one of those true iconic type of dream matches, it really got the fans salivating and thinking about the possibilities of all of this. But then that ultimately didn't come to pass. But you wondered, could it ever happen? What would happen if Sting ever did decide to finally, once and for all, make the jump to WWE? Kind of one of those last things of your career to do, one of those closing salvos, a perfect kind of bow on a legendary Hall of Fame career. Well, we got that answer when Sting debuted at Survivor Series 2014. The WWE, to me, for so many years, has been able to survive and at times thrive by coasting through a lot of mediocre to sometimes crap, but giving you that one redeeming quality, that one moment in time that makes you forget everything else, that sucks you in and keeps you wanting more, more, more. And after so many years, two and a half decades plus of being a massive star in professional wrestling, here's Sting, the stinger, the legend, the icon who's done so many great things in his career. Here he is finally in a WWE arena, in a WWE ring. And then when he kicks Triple H and hits the Scorpion death drop on him, are you kidding me? I freaking lost my shit. I still get goose pimples three years later thinking about this. This was a big deal. It's a massive deal. And easily one of the truly great moments of the PG era. But for number one, there could only be one. For number one, there was only one. This was never in question. This was never in doubt. This is OTRS Central. I'm the Schleg Daddy. This used to be the litter box that Smokey played in. What the fuck else did you think was going to be the greatest moment of the PG era other than Mark motherfucking Henry winning the WWE World Heavyweight Championship by hitting that world's strongest slam on Randall Keith Orton at Night of Champions 2011? Mark Henry, who had been through so much shit with this company over 15 years, who had done so many things but had ultimately been kept from being a world champion. With all the history of the lack of black world champions, WWE or even world heavyweight champion, it didn't matter. But the moment was right, the timing was right, the opportunity was right for the company and frankly for this channel too on so many different levels. And when Mark Henry locked that world's strongest slam in and he dropped him and it counted one, two, three, beyond question, it is my favorite moment of the PG era, it is one of my favorite moments in WWE history, and beyond question to me, it is the single greatest moment of the PG era, how quickly you forget. If you don't like Mark Henry, fuck you. Who's the world's strongest man? Mark motherfucking Henry, that's who. Now where's my motherfucking cheese bug? You damn right. Mark Henry, fuck the world. Well, that's my list of the eight greatest moments of the PG era. And again, it's my list. If you don't agree with my list, that's tough shit. If you don't like my list, you can kiss my ass. Because it's my list and I make no apologies for it. And in particular, if you have a problem with Mark Henry winning the World Heavyweight Championship at Night of Champions 2011... Being the number one greatest moment of the PG era, I got a double fuck you just for you. That one's for you, Smokey. That's right. Even from beyond the grave, still running this shit.